Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Life Groups. Uh, this is Pastor Rich, as you know, and this is our beginning of our Life Groups for the uh, spring, I guess, late winter, early spring of, of 2021. Uh, we're talking about evangelism, sharing the love of Jesus with those who don't know him. And our, uh, our topic is preparing for the harvest. Next six weeks, we'll be meeting uh, the first and third uh, weeks of March and of April as well. And the last week, first week of May, we'll, we'll wrap it up the first week of May. And then this week, it gives us a total of six weeks. And each week, we're going to be talking about very practical ways that you can equip yourself in preparing for the harvest. Very practical ways on how you can do evangelism. I want to equip you to the point where you're comfortable enough to ask someone to join hands with you and, and lead them in a sinner's prayer to receive Jesus as their, as their Savior. There's no greater purpose, no greater calling, no greater privilege a Christian can have than to be a, a worker, a co-laborer with Jesus, working in the harvest, uh, bringing, in, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the souls into the kingdom. So uh, all of us can do our part. Not all of us are going to have maybe have the privilege of being able to pray with someone, but we have the privilege of planting seeds and watering seeds, uh, rooting out lies, speaking the truth, uh, pulling out the weeds out of people's lives so they can come to the place of having a clear revelation of the great grace and love of God and be able to uh, come into a come into a relationship uh, with Jesus. So as we uh, launch this out, I want our, our topic this uh, this session is how to tell our story, how to, sharing our story. Now, sometimes we use the word story, you think about, you know, a fairy tale or, you know, a nursery rhyme or something like that, something that's not true, it's something that's fabricated, like a novel is a story. But if you think about a story, story is what all of us live. We love stories. All of us love stories. We, we love to be able to, uh, sorry about that. We, we love to be able to tell, tell stories and we love to, we love to hear stories. One of the my, my, some of the most impactful movies that I've ever watched are, are movies that are based on the true life story of an individual. And they, uh, you know, they, they tell the person's story and all the relationships and the, and, the, and the difficulties and the challenges and the triumphs and all those kinds of things. Then what I really enjoy is at the end of the movie, it has either a photograph, a black, usually it's like a black and white photograph with a bunch of text below that says this person did this and that and so forth. And this other person that was in the movie did this and this person did that. Or in some cases, they'll have, I've even seen some movies where they had black and white uh, 16 millimeter film clips that were shown and the person was actually talking in their 80s or whatever, how old they were, and you know, verifying that this was a genuine person. And then, uh, so it's the stories and their life and, and those are the things that are most impactful to us and uh, help shape us and help, help fashion us. So the scripture, we're gonna unpack some of these verses in the, in the worksheet after the video. But one of the principal verses we're looking at today, it says that we should always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us uh, with meekness and gentleness, meekness and fear, I think is what scripture actually says, meekness and fear and meekness. So we need to be ready to give an answer. So, you know, an answer, a defense for why we're trusting in Jesus. Another verse we're gonna look at, it, scripture says that we are living letters known and read of all men, living epistles known and read of all men. So our lives are that. Each one of us are an eyewitness. We've had an eyewitness experience, an eyewitness encounter with Jesus. If you know Jesus as your personal savior, then you have a story you can tell about your life and your spiritual journey that you're having with Jesus. And it's, a, it's one of the most impactful uh, ways of sharing our testimony that you can, with firsthand experience, uh, and knowledge tell people what Jesus means to you. So we need to be ready to give an answer for that. So in some cases, it's our full story. It's the story about how we, how we, you know, what our life was at, at like before we became a Christian. Uh, when Jesus, we tell the story and the circumstances about how we came to know Jesus as our Savior and what it means to walk with Jesus and talk with him along life's narrow way now as we are enjoying the abundant life that he's provided for us. So our story is ongoing. And uh, what we need to do is we need to learn how to how to polish our story, edit our story, if you will, and make it the most impactful and have it uh, ready to be able to pull components from our story for, of our relationship with Jesus and be able to share that with individuals and it will impact them and help them. You know, oftentimes when I'm talking to somebody that's having difficulties and having struggles, you know, parts of my story 
uh, or helpful to theirs because I can say, you know, I understand what you're going through. I went through that. Somebody says something about how, you know, they're, they're hurt and they're, and they're sorrowful because they lost one of their parents. I can relate to that. I can say, I lost my dad three years ago and I know what you're talking about. And, and I'm, 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 I'm able to connect with them. I'm able to connect with them and tell them how Jesus has given me confidence that I'll see my dad again on the other side. And, and uh, those kinds of things. And so part of my story can help someone. So your parts of your story can impact truth and, and love and life to other individuals. And the scripture says in John chapter seven, that from our inner being flows rivers of living water. And as we share our story, the Holy Spirit makes that alive and makes it pertinent to that. So what I wanna share with you here uh, today is you guys are gonna go through the paper. I'm not gonna spend any time that it's on the paper. You're gonna work through the paper and you have an assignment. And I wanna encourage you about the assignment before I get into the message here. Here is you have an assignment to write your testimony. You'll see there's six different things there six different questions you need to answer. And it may seem a little bit daunting and overwhelming, especially if you're not a, if you're not a, a, a person that you know, writes a lot or types a lot, but you have two weeks to do it. You, know, you have two weeks to work on it because we will be meeting again. Uh, we won't be meeting again now until the first week in, uh, in March. So you'll have two weeks uh, to work on this assignment and polish it and get it, get it going. Uh, and so I encourage you to do it. Don't, don't put it off, get on it right away, work on it a little bit as you can. And, and you help to edit and polish up your, your, your testimony. And then we're gonna be, uh, we'll be all joined back together again here in two weeks. We'll, uh, in your life group, you'll be able, you'll read your story and, and uh, let everybody be impacted by that. So, uh, and then from this and the weeks to come here, one of my goals for 2021 is to have some regular testimonies of people telling their story about giving, their, giving testimony of their, how they came to faith as well as how uh, Jesus, what Jesus means to them in their day-to-day -day walk. So you may be called upon to, to share your testimony from the pulpit. And by doing this exercise, it will help you in polishing it up and giving you more confidence and be able to communicate it and not be, I don't know how many times you've, you've said something, you've shared a part of your story with someone. You thought, dang, I left out this part. I forgot this piece over here. Uh, how, how could I forget that? You know. So by writing it out, it'll help you to help you refresh uh, your encounter with Jesus and your day-to-day -day life with Jesus, and it'll be, uh, it'll be available to you to impact others. So I want to talk to you about how the Apostle Paul used his testimony to impact people in multiple places. We see it, he's talking about how in Acts chapter 24, he, he's, he uses his testimony, part of a little bit of his testimony, what he's doing, what he's gone through to impact uh, 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 Felix, who was the governor of the region at the time, and then uh, after Felix, Felix left, he was uh, the governor for a period of time. A guy by the name of Festus came and became the governor of Caesarea, where Paul was at. Paul was brought under house arrest in Caesarea for preaching the gospel. The Jews were trying to kill Paul. They were trying to lay, lay traps for him, uh, and they, they weren't successful. Uh, and the, God had his hand upon Paul. So Paul was a citizen of Rome, freeborn, as well as a, a citizen of, uh, of Israel you know, a, a son of Abraham, and he was in prison, he was beaten, all these things happened to him. So he used the I'm a citizen of Rome card and said, look, I want my case to be a, to appear before Caesar, uh, Caesar in Rome. I'm a Roman citizen. You've brought these false charges against me. You've beaten me. You've held me against my will. And I, I, I have the right to appear before, uh, before Caesar as a Roman citizen who's been falsely accused, falsely arrested. So uh, so this was, he was working towards that. So before he was able to go to Rome, he had to appear before King Agrippa. King Agrippa was the, was the king of, Ju uh, of, of Judea, uh, which is a region, actually it was beyond Judea. It was Judea all the way up into Asia Minor. Asia Minor would be the, been the whole region uh, of, it was called Asia Minor because it was, it was not Asia as we know it to be uh, now today. But it's all this area north of Jerusalem, which would which would now would be modern day Turkey. So modern day Turkey at the time was called Asia Minor. And King Agrippa, King Agrippa was a Roman citizen. He was a Roman. He was actually King Herod. If you remember King Herod in the beginning of Luke, and he called for uh, the, the the killing of all the babies in uh, in the area two years and under. That's when Jesus and uh, was taken by Joseph and Mary, and they fled to Egypt. They were warned by an angel to do that and all the children two years of age and under were killed and after Herod King Herod died they came back and and uh, they came back from Egypt and you know, came back to the back to Israel well King Agrippa is the great grandson 
of King Herod. And he was the king of this whole northern region, all of modern day Turkey, some of the area north of, of Jerusalem there as well. And uh, so he was, he was the, uh, the king in that area. So Festus, the governor, is bringing Paul to the, uh, to, to the, to the king to make the decision as to whether the king is going to make, a, make the call about Paul's situation or whether he's going to allow Paul to go to Caesar and appeal to the main king. Uh, and like basically go to the Supreme Court for a hearing. Uh, how you go up through different courts, you have the local court and then you have the state Supreme Court and the lower federal courts, that kind of a thing. So he's making his progressions to be able to plead his case before Caesar, which was what Paul wanted to do because God had told him he was gonna go to Rome and he was gonna be a witness there, but he was gonna suffer things. So Paul knew that this was part of his plan. So I'm gonna read all of Acts chapter 26 to you, make some comments here along the way. And uh, so this is the apostle Paul coming before King Agrippa and and Paul does exactly what we're going to do in our exercises, talks about what his life was like before he met Christ. Then he's going to talk about his conversion on the road of Damascus. Then he's going to talk about what life is like with Christ and what he's doing. And, and we're going to see how impactful this is to all the people that are there. Now, there's a whole group of people. It isn't just King Agrippa. King Agrippa comes there. He got his whole entourage. You know, he's got all of his all of his uh, bodyguards that are there, other dignitaries, as a, you know, Whatever all the all the uh, his his council his, his advisory board uh, his uh, executive branch if you will that is that is with him as well as uh, uh, Festus is that is there uh, um, uh, as well and his little entourage and there's other notable people that are there there are Jewish people there Jewish dignitaries and, and the high priest and others that want to see Paul killed they're there hoping that things go to their favor that Paul doesn't go to Rome so they can continue to plot and figure out how they can kill this guy and so there's a there's a large group of people there it doesn't tell us a number but we know from the what what of what was transpiring there's a there's a great number of people there so Acts chapter 26 verse 1 then Agrippa said to Paul you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused of by the Jews, especially because you are a, an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently my manner of life from my youth. So he started sorry, to talk about his life before his conversion. The manner of my life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They know me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes earnestly served God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused by the Jews. So what he's saying here is our hope was the Messiah was going to come. We were promised the Messiah who would be the Lamb of God, who would take away our sins. It was promised to our ancestors, to our fathers. And we've been, and this promise has been fulfilled. And now I'm being accused of representing and speaking on behalf of the, of the very Messiah of Israel. Verse 8, why should it be thought uh, incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of, the, of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly Enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. When we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people 
as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Paul tells a little bit about what he was like. I was a, I was a Pharisee. I lived by this. I, I was dedicated to this, waiting for the promise of the Messiah to come. The Messiah has now come, so I'm, I'm representing him. These Jews are persecuting me as a result of that. And then he talks, talks very uh, specifically about his testimony. Now, now, just something to think about here. All he said was the actual encounter that he had with Jesus. He could have gone into a whole lot of details. He could have said that he was blind for three days, and an ice came, tied him up, and you know, brought him, you know, and, and prayed for him, and his eyes came open, and he went off in the wilderness and was taught by the Holy Spirit, and he and he found out all these Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus, and it, he's been he's been preaching from the Old Testament that Jesus is the Messiah ever since. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that a whole lot of details that he's given in other places. Everything that I told you, we find in other places in the Book of Acts, and also in some of his letters. Uh, but he didn't give this full blown. It's not like me when I give my testimony about how I got saved in Fairbanks, Alaska, you know, and I, and it takes an hour to do it. He's just given a short uh, uh, part of his testimony here to impact uh, his audience. So when we give testimony, we need to think about the audience that we're addressing. How do we, how can we, what part of our testimony can we share that will both most impact the one person we're speaking to at work, the family we're sharing the gospel with, whoever this, whoever this person is. So verse 19, now, Paul draws King Agrippa in. He's given this oration to King Agrippa as the principal person he's speaking to, but all these other people around him are, are listening. And um, so now he's going to draw King Agrippa in. So, so he's, verse 19, he's getting his attention. He says, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent Turn to God and do works befitting of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and to great, saying no other things than those things which the prophets and Moses said would come. That the Christ would suffer, that he would be first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So, so again, so Paul's still witnessing. He's 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 talking to the he's talking to King Agrippa. He draws King Agrippa in, but he is he is witnessing by telling his story and telling what he's being persecuted for and clarifying what he's doing. Uh, it's it's a, it's just brilliant. What he's doing here is brilliant. Verse twenty four. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, "Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning has driven you mad." So the governor Festus says, Paul, you're 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 a whack, man. You're just you're a whack job, you know, is what he's saying. And um and Paul says, But I am not mad, most noble Festus, but because the words of uh, I speak the words of truth and reason. Now here's an important part here. Verse 25 says, I, I am not mad, most noble Festus. So he showed great respect to the authority, even though this guy was a pagan, he worshipped all the pagan gods of, of Rome. You know, we think Paul, he thought Paul was mad because of this, but he was mad, nuts in his head, because he believed in Zeus and, and Poseidon and Aphrodite and, and all the rest of the, uh, all, all the rest of the Roman gods and, and, and the polytheism, multiple gods that he believed in. But Paul doesn't belittle him. He doesn't berate, berate him. Uh, I mean, as a Jew, Paul would have been unhappy that Rome was controlling the region and, and putting taxes upon his people and burdening the people. I mean, so he had a, Internally, I'm sure he had a, 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 some level of disdain towards the Roman rule over their area, but yet he showed respect. The Bible says we should honor all men, honor all men, especially the household of faith. We should give honor to whom honor is due. So in this, in this situation, Paul respects the authority. He respects the position. Uh, you know, and, and if you can't respect the person, you need to respect the position. You know, uh, there's, there's something about building a culture of honor that is very impactful. So he says, most noble thesis, but I speak the words of truth and of reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escaped his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. So 
the whole this whole thing that's been going on with me being in prison and going town to town this isn't news to you king agrippa i know that you're you're aware that this has been going on um verse 27 this is king agrippa's response so so here's paul he told a little bit about his bc days before christ days told about it a little bit about his conversion experience told about what he's been doing since he was since he's been converted and and he's and all along it's jesus centric man it's jesus centric he's talking about jesus and his testimony he's talking about this same jesus as the one that the moses and the prophets promised us to be and i think i think you know you know this because you're not ignorant of the of the jewish faith and the promises that they're that are part of the jewish faith so he is you know he's using all this and this is king agrippa's response now you know paul was pleading his case to King Agrippa so that he could go, so the King Agrippa would say, you're right, you need to go to Rome. I don't find anything wrong with you. I want to send you to Rome and you can meet with Caesar because Paul is looking for doors to be open for him to share the gospel. So Paul wasn't concerned that he was, that his, that his travel was somewhat restricted. He was under house arrest. He'd been on the house arrest for two years. Two years he's been under house arrest under, under uh, uh, Felix. And now Festus is the, uh, has taken over the position uh, of governor and then paul said hey i want to i want to go before king agrippa so festus is bringing him before king agrippa so here's king agrippa's response after all this uh paul says in verse 7 27 king agrippa do you believe the prophets i know that you do believe then agrippa said to paul you almost persuade me to become a christian wow how powerful is that so the apostle paul he's not quote in scripture he's not preaching he's not saying repent for the end is near he is sharing his story he's sharing his spiritual journey his faith story of how he how he how he served god as a as a jew now he's serving god as a christian how he encountered jesus on the road and his testimony has had such an impact on king agrippa king agrippa says you almost persuade me to become a christian which was totally foreign to king agrippa again because he had been a polytheistic uh you know worshiper of all the all the roman uh, deities that they had at that time verse 29 and paul said i would to god that not only you but also all who hear me today might become both and almost uh altogether such as i am except for these chains chains when he had said these things the king stood up as well as the governor and bernice and those who sat with them and when they had gone aside they talked among themselves saying this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains and king agrippa said to festus this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So, so now we find that uh, because Paul made the appeal to go to Caesar, King Agrippa has to either say, no, you can't go or you can go. And he says, yeah, you, you have justification to go. Uh, but Paul could have just said, hey, King Agrippa, you decide uh, and, uh, and, I, and I'll be satisfied with your thing. And if, and if Paul knew about King Agrippa, he kept saying, you know this, you know this. So. You would think that, uh, well, it sounds very, just in context, King Agrippa would have said, we find nothing worthy of chains or death. We need to let this guy go, but we can't because he's appealing to Caesar. So Paul knew exactly what he was doing in the sequence of events, meeting these higher officials, climbing up the, the political ladder structure, if you will, proclaiming his testimony as a form of witnessing, and then eventually making it to Caesar. And we know that when he's in, you know, when, when he's in Rome, he's, has, he says that what has happened to me in Rome or is this sad? I think this is in Timothy. He said, what's happened to me in Rome has rather fallen out for my good because I'm impacting, uh, you know, everyone, the guards every day, people are visiting, coming, I'm, in, I'm under house arrest, but the whole household of Caesar is hearing the gospel. And uh, so Paul knows what he's doing. So saints, our testimony, our story that we have in our journey with Jesus, our pre-Jesus days, our encountering Jesus days, and even if, you know, you think, you think, well, Pastor Rich, my testimony isn't very powerful. It's not very exciting. It's not like I was, you know, uh, riding with the hell's angels and a drug dealer and I was with a mafia, you know, but then I got saved, you know. So that doesn't just because you've had, you know, you've not had a, a horrible, sinful lifestyle prior to your conversion doesn't mean that your, your story is not impactful. I think a story that's very impactful is a, someone who comes to know Jesus at a very young age and has been faithful to serve him throughout their teenage years and college years and young adult years, and here they are, whatever, middle age, and they're still serving Jesus. To me, that's a powerful testimony of the, of the reality of the keeping power of God, of the, of the joy and the peace that comes from knowing Jesus, that 
all the temptations of the world have not drawn you away and you've been faithful to the Lord ever since you were a young child. To me, that's a powerful testimony that can have impact on people when you share that, share that gospel message. They'll go away and say, there's something about that person, man, that they've been walking with Jesus for all this time. And I know what they're like. They're a good person. They're, they're a good worker. You know, they're, they're a trustworthy person. And 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 their your lifestyle and your testimony can have part can have powerful impact. So, um, so we see this, and you know, Paul is in other places he shared that. And we're going to be looking at some of these other examples of in the scriptures about giving our testimonies in the weeks to come. But this week we're going to work on uh, being able to uh, prepare ourselves to be able to give an answer for the hope that is within us, which is Jesus. And uh, we have this exercise to do. And you, know, you have some papers to go through. So I, I, I pray that this has been a blessing to you and that you can see the impact that Paul's testimony had and realize that yours can have the same impact. And just like any great story, you know, when someone has a great story and they want to, and it ends up in being turned into a book or it ends up being turned into a manuscript and given to a producer or given to somebody about uh, to see if they would write it, make a movie out of it. I mean, you have this rough draft that you write up. Then it goes through this refining process. You know, it's edited and re-edited and, and certain details that are unnecessary are taken out, you know, and other things that, are, you know, some ex, some some uh, um, research is done and other information is added to it. Uh, so that's that same thing. We're going to have this process of, so to speak, of, of writing a rough, rough draft of our testimonies and then going through the self-editing process and then presenting the, the final, what we think to be the final draft. Uh, to someone we know well and let them look at it and critique it uh, for, for in, a, in a good way to say, hey, you forgot this part of your testimony or what about this detail? You know what, this big long thing here, this is really is irrelevant. It's kind of off the path. I think you ought to take that out. And we're going to refine this thing so that we're able to be able to present our story in a very impactful way and in a very accurate way, honest, uh, an honest way. And I believe the Holy Spirit will use that and pierce people's hearts just like it pierced King Agrippa's heart. King Agrippa was was enraptured by the story of Paul's testimony, and it, and, it, and and after Paul said, he says, King, he said to Paul, Paul, you know, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. King Agrippa kind of lost what a, what he was even there for. He's hearing this powerful story about this man and his encounter with God, and it's and it got him got him drawn in. He forgot almost for a minute that he was supposed to be judging whether this man needs to be stay in prison, be uh, be executed, or you know, sent to Caesar. And uh, so, it's, so, so our testimony has a great, powerful impact. So uh, God bless you guys. Father God, I just pray for every person that's uh, listened to this today. Ask Holy Spirit that you would give them creativity and insight as they write their testimony and as they uh, write their, their, their life's journey with you, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that you would use this exercise to equip us and to polish us, that we might be able to uh, give an answer for the hope that's within us and be able to be salt and light for everyone that we come in contact with. And Lord God, you would use this exercise in the future to, uh, to give us doors of opportunity it would be open to us that we might be able to share our story, our journey with you to others, and that we might have the same impact upon them as Paul's testimony had upon King Agrippa. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, saints. I love you. See you in church. See you Sunday. And if Jesus comes back, I'll see you there before I see you here. God bless you. Bye-bye.